it really is true that He is Alpha and Omega. In the beginning, He said, let there be light. And ever since every day, the sun has been coming up to make you thirsty for the light behind the light. And in the end, He is going to blot out the dark sun and will shine as God. And what does light do? It envelops us. We are surrounded by light in here. It is all over us. That's the way God will be in the new Jerusalem for His people. We will not have to travel to find Him. He will be as near as light is to your skin. And He will be the Lamb who loved you and gave Himself for you. What difference does it make that God is Alpha and Omega? That's the question John Piper answers from Revelation 21, 1 to 8 in this episode of Light and Truth. This sermon was originally preached at Bethlehem Baptist Church on October 14, 1984. Let's read verses 5 through 8 of Revelation 21 and spend the rest of our time meditating on it. And he who sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without price from the fountain of the water of life. He who conquers shall have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the polluted, as for murderers, fornicators, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their lot shall be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, what this text makes clear is that God is the end of everybody's road. He is everybody's omega, but not in the same way for everybody. For the thirsty, it says in verse 6, He is the end in the sense that He will be the source of their life forever. He will be their God. They will be His children forever and ever. He was the fountain of life in the beginning to bring them to life, and He will be the fountain of life in the end to supply living water to all eternity. For those who conquer, for those who have a conquering thirst for God, He is not the beginning and the end in the sense that a river has a beginning and a stream and an end in the ocean. Because an ocean is supplied and filled up by its rivers. God is not supplied or filled up by people who come to Him thirsty to drink. Instead, the image we should have in our minds probably is that He is the beginning and the end of our lives the way He is the beginning and the end of a desert caravan. They begin at an oasis on this side with much water bubbling up and they end in an oasis on the other side with an eternal fountain. God is the supply of their life here. He will go on supplying their life forever. He will be their eternal supply from beginning to end. But there's another group in the text, verse 8. These are the people who were not thirsty for God, but found their satisfaction in many other things, which we'll talk about in a minute. God is their end too. They will meet God in the end. He will be their omega, namely their judge. They began the same place everybody else began. They took their life as a sovereign gift from God, And then they started out in the desert and they took that awful turn to the south where the shallow streams of sin are so attractive and they moved along through the desert supplying themselves from those streams and when they got to the end there will be no oasis and no fountain of life but only a big spreading yellow lake of fire. Many Christians today do not believe in the eternality of hell. Evangelicals, so-called, espouse views that say, okay, 
there's a hell, but it's not eternal. It's purgative, not punitive. It cleanses. And in the end, even through hell, all will be redeemed and join the family of God. Many people today say that. Verse 8 does not shrink back from the terrible reality. As for the cowardly, the faithless, the polluted, for murderers, fornicators, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their lot shall be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. These are terrifying words. These are terrifying words. To hear these words without a tremor in your heart is a terrible indication about the condition of your heart. God is a never-ending omega for every one of you. And you will meet Him as a fountain of life or as a lake of fire with no middle ground. He may seem distant now, but Paul said to the people... The scoffers in Athens, he is not far from each one of us. He is never out of the reach of the thirsty. And for the self-satisfied, he may seem as far away as moon cheese. But in the end, he will be terrifyingly real. And my prayer as I preach this message is that he might come real now. Lest he have to be real terrifyingly then. I am Alpha and Omega, says the Lord, the beginning and the end, the fountain of eternal life and the lake of fire, depending on how you meet me. Life is serious, isn't it? Life between Alpha and Omega is an immensely serious matter, and we treat it so trivially. It may be that you are secure in the life raft with the captain this morning. But even if you are in the life raft with the captain, surely 80 foot waves and thunder and lightning and gale winds and darkness ought to send a tremor through your heart so that you hold to him in all fear and trembling. There's a great division that's coming. It's already happened for many. And we need to know what that division is. We need to know what's the difference between the people who take the northern route through the desert, the narrow and straight route that ends in the eternal oasis, and the people who take the southern route of sin and find themselves thrown into the lake of fire at the end of their journey. What's the difference? Because we have to know if we're on one route or the other. And this text gives clear clues as to what kind of people are going to make it to one destination or the other. So let's look at them. There are two words that describe the people on the northern route that end in the oasis where the fountain of life is. And the first word is in verse 6, and it's thirsty. To the thirsty, to the thirsty I will give water without price from the fountain of the water of life. So the first characteristic of people who are on the right road and will end in the oasis of life is that they're thirsty for God. Revelation 22:17 is a beautiful invitation. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Let him who hears say, Come. Let him who is thirsty come. Let him who desires take the water of life without price. So what does God mean when He says, To the thirsty I'm going to give this water of life? He means to people who desire Me, who have turned away from the thirsts of the world and are now desiring Jesus Christ and thirsting after Him, who have given up on the soul beverages of the earth and have found their soul-satisfying beverage in Jesus Christ only. He does not mean that anybody who thirsts for eternal life is going to get it. Nobody wants to go to hell. He doesn't mean thirst in that sense. He means thirsty for God. People who have had a conquering thirst that drives them away from thirst for power, praise, prestige, pleasures that you can get with money, driven them away from that right into the heart of God 
hungry and thirsty for Him. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for God's righteousness. They're the ones who will be satisfied. And here's the second word. It's in verse 7, and it's the word conquer. He who conquers shall have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Now, that word conquer is used in the book of Revelation about a dozen times to refer to the victory that Christians get so that they can have at the end the inheritance of eternal life. And I want to direct you to one of those uses. Chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. Chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. You know these are letters to the seven churches in Asia. Every one of those letters end with these words. To him who conquers, I will... And then are the magnificent promises of those letters. And they include eternal life. Let's look at this one. Chapter 2, verse 10. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who conquers shall not be hurt by the second death. Now, what's that? Remember chapter 21, verse 8. The second death is the lake of fire. Hell is the second death. So what this text is saying is that for those who conquer, they will not go to hell. Hell will not harm them. Second death, lake of fire, will not harm them if they conquer. And what is conquering? It's defined for us. Be faithful unto death and I will give you life. Conquering means getting the victory over all the forces that would tempt you to be faithless to Jesus Christ. Now let's put these two words together, thirsty and conquer, and talk about a conquering thirst. Because only a conquering thirst brings you through. There's a battle going on in your heart and in mine every day. The battle is between thirst for God and thirst for the world. Two thirsts every day in your heart. You don't wake up and have no thirsts. You thirst every day, either for God or for the world. Let's look at verse 8, because we need to hear a warning about the kind of desires that compete with Jesus Christ. Do you remember back in chapter 2 now, the warning Jesus gave? He said in verse 10 and 11 of chapter 2, Fear not what you are about to suffer. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Notice those two words. Fear not, be faithful. What's the opposite? Cowardliness and faithlessness. And that's where this verse starts. In fact, this verse is a list of failures to heed the warnings in chapters 2 and 3. The first thing he says about these people is that they are cowardly and faithless. They have sought after and thirsted for the security and the happiness that the world could bring. And therefore they have turned away in fear from what it costs to be a Christian. They have sought after self-reliance and therefore they have turned away from a life of humble faith. They have been thirsty. Oh, yes, they have been thirsty. And they have been thirsty for the wrong things. Then God goes on to say some of them who go to the lake of fire are people who are polluted. That means they are people who have thirsted after hidden and indecent things. Then he says some of them are murderers. They are people who thirsted after vengeance or after the convenience of having somebody out of the way. And they have loved that and cherished it and carried it right through to murder. Then he says some of them are fornicators, people who have thirsted after sexual pleasure which Jesus Christ has forbidden. But it was so attractive they were enslaved. And then some of them are sorcerers. They have thirsted after magical powers. They have 
thirsted after what chapter 2 calls the deep things of Satan. They have wanted to know by the stars or by some mental agency the future. They have wanted power in ESP. These are the people who are thirsting in the wrong direction and are not satisfied with Jesus Christ and will end in the lake of fire. And some of them, it says, are idolaters. People who have thirsted after manageable gods. Gods that you can take off the shelf and put in the drawer. Gods who cannot say, I am Alpha and Omega besides me. There are no gods. No, not that. Give me an idol. I will worship at my terms. And some of them are liars. This is an amazing thing. Liars go to hell. Why? Because liars are people who have not thirsted for the future that God will give to the integrity of faith. Instead, they are people who have craved and thirsted after the future that they can create by manifold deceits, duplicities, masks, and lies. People who live lives of duplicitousness and are constantly putting up fronts because they cannot trust God with what would come by His sovereign pleasure if they were honest. And unbelief always sends people to the lake of fire. In other words, the people who end up in the lake of fire are people who have not been able to conquer the thirst for the world and all that it has to offer. They are going to meet God and have to give an account for the infinite insult of preferring something to Him. It is an infinite sin to prefer anything to an infinitely attractive God, which is why hell is just. I'll repeat that. It is an infinite sin to prefer anything to an infinitely attractive God. And therefore, hell is just. If there is any thirst in you this morning, praise God for it and take it and throw it against the thirst of the world that clamors for your taste. I want to close with five brief Reasons for why you should be thirsty this morning. Because I want to try to be the instrument of the Holy Spirit to make you thirsty for God. I don't want anybody to leave here dead in trespasses and sins, unable to thirst for Jesus Christ. Reason number one, in verse six, the water of life that he has to offer is free. To the thirsty, I will give water without price. Now, you do have to be thirsty to get this water. To the thirsty, I will give this water. But who has ever said that thirst is a price? Who has ever said that thirst is currency with which you can purchase or barter or merit anything? Thirst is not a work. Thirst is faith. What is faith but a recognition of emptiness and a craving and reaching outside oneself to what can satisfy you? When a person crosses a desert and winds up at the oasis, thirsty, on the other side, and he hears the owner of the oasis say, to the thirsty, I will give to drink. Nobody says, oh, you drive a hard bargain. Reason number two, it's a warning, but it's here. Remember that the one who offers this water is Alpha and Omega. He is at the beginning. He will meet you at the end. If you turn back, if you turn forward to look for another satisfaction for your thirst, you meet God only. And therefore, it is a foolish thing. It is the height of folly to move through the world looking for an alternative satisfaction to your soul's longing when you know that He is Omega. You will meet God. And he will say, have you been satisfied with all my riches? Third, verse 7, the water of life is the same as the reward of sonship. 
He who conquers shall have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Now, I ask you, honestly, be reasonable. Can you think if you had a thousand years of a benefit greater than being a son of God? Can you think of any? Because being a son of God means that all that God has is your inheritance. There is no good thing that God will withhold from His thirsty children. No good thing can you imagine will be denied you in the age to come forever and ever. It will be poured out upon you a thousandfold. Only foolishness, only blindness turns away from this offer this morning. God holds out sonship to everyone, an inheritance of all that He is and has to give. It's going to be just like the father of the prodigal son. God is going to run out of this oasis before you get there. He's going to give you a big bear hug, cover you with kisses, put a ring on your finger, a cloak on your back, shoes on your feet, usher you in, kill the fatted calf, put a choice sirloin before you, sit you at His table, and it will last forever, and you will drink the most satisfying water that you can imagine, and He will delight to be your God forever and ever and ever. You can't turn that down for a TV, for money, for sex, for drugs, for unfaithfulness. You can't if your eyes are open. And fourth, reflect on the value of verse 5. What a verse. What a great verse. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain anymore. For the former things are gone. All pain gone, all death gone, anything that makes you cry is gone. And in its place comes a joy, a childlike delight, a leaping like a lamb that is going to last forever and be better than the best vacation you've ever spent in your life. And finally, look at the beautiful picture of verses 22 and 23. And I saw no temple in the city. For its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine upon it. For the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is Christ the Lamb. It really is true that He is Alpha and Omega. In the beginning, He said, Let there be light, and ever since every day the sun has been coming up to make you thirsty for the light behind the light. And in the end, He is going to blot out the dark sun and will shine as God. And what does light do? It envelops us. We are surrounded by light in here. It is all over us. That's the way God will be in the new Jerusalem for His people. We will not have to travel to find Him. He will be as near as light is to your skin. And He will be the Lamb who loved you and gave himself for you. So I close with this great invitation from chapter 2. The Spirit and the Bride, the Holy Spirit and the Church, beckon, come. To the thirsty, he says, come. To he who desires to drink of the water of life freely, come. Now unto him who is able to satisfy the deepest longing of your soul, to Alpha and Omega, Jesus Christ the Father and the Holy Spirit, be glory, dominion, thanks and honor forevermore. And all the thirsty people of God said, Amen. This is Light and Truth, God-centered preaching to help you see Christ clearly and treasure Him truly. I'm your host, Dan Kruver. Thank you for listening. On our next episode, John Piper continues our eight-part series, The God We Trust, with a sermon titled, He Who Inhabits Eternity. I hope you'll join us. For more resources, visit DesiringGod.org.